Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and recently we've been talking a lot about all the lore. Specifically the Kurgans, some minor chaos factions, some Skaven clans and a few other bits. But what if we turn our attentions to the Empire, to a race which was introduced in the very early years of Warhammer Fantasy and quietly disappeared for a while until very recently. This, of course, are the Gnomes. Yes, Gnomes actually do exist in the Warhammer Fantasy universe. I'm not too sure about Age of Sigmar, but they have been here for a long, long time now, and they are quite an interesting race as they do have their own culture, they have their own gods, and quite a few other things. So what I want to do in this video is talk about the history of gnomes. So the gnomes of Warhammer Fantasy were introduced a long, long time ago, back in the Warhammer 1st edition for Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, and... Yeah, a lot has changed, keep in mind that a lot of things that we will be discussing here aren't canon, however, a few other things are, as they've been updated for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition. But there's a few bits of information, so let's first talk about the Gnomish characters. Well, Gnomic is actually the name. Considering the number of Gnomic communities to be found in the Old World, they are only slightly less numerous than the Halflings, the omission of gnome player characters amounts to a rare oversight in the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay rules. Keep in mind that these books were kind of written back then in the perspective of a GM talking directly to you. So this chapter should go some way towards filling that gap. It is, however, beyond the scope of this chapter to deal with all the myriad variations of gnomic society that may be found throughout the known world. Instead, the information presented here is intended to relate specifically to the gnomes within the northeastern area of the Old World known as the Empire. Given that the enemy within campaign is set in the Empire, it is hoped that this may be of use to GMs running that campaign. Those of you who are running campaigns in other areas should treat the article as a set of guidelines. The Gnomes of Albion, for example, may well have quite different attitudes and beliefs, although these are likely to be superficial rather than racial differences. You should also bear in mind the fact that by far the great the greatest concentration of gnomic burrows is to be found in the foothills on the western edges of the World's Edge Mountains. Okay, so this already gives us quite a decent amount of information, as this lets us know already straight off the bat that there are gnomes in loads of different locations. We know them mainly because of the Empire, but we can find them in the western portions of the World's Edge Mountains, meaning that they would be very much bordering the Darklands. And the fact that we also know that some gnomes could be in Albion. Now, that's no surprise considering that anything that is kind of humanoid style would probably have some ties to Albion, especially if they're rather ancient and so on. But yeah, this is actually pretty important to know as it sets the setting off strong. But perhaps something that is kind of expected is the fact that gnomes do form part of the everyday life of the Empire. We do get Imperial gnomes. So let's read over this passage. Within the Empire, gnomes have a reputation for clannishness, being regarded as a well-balanced race insofar as they obviously have a chip on both shoulders. It is true that they do not easily mix with the other races, adventurers being an exception to this of course, but they are by no means as secretive and withdrawn as, for example, the Wood Elves of Laurelorn Forest. Gnome peddlers are a relatively common sight, and gnome smiths and engineers are accorded almost as much respect as their dwarfen counterparts, often more. Oh, it's a big heresy here. But this is usually from fear of their acerbic wit and sharp tongue sarcasm. Indeed, it is probably the gnomic capacity for vitriol which led to the appointment of a gnome as Imperial Court Jester as long ago as 1143 of the Imperial Calendar. Since then, such appointments have become a tradition, and one which the current Emperor Karl Franz I continues to maintain. Nonetheless, gnomes prefer to live among other gnomes in self-contained isolated communities. These are invariably burrows or cavern networks beneath the Empire's numerous limestone plateaus and other hill ranges. The gnomic fondness for fishing is almost as infamous as their love of practical jokes, and no permanent settlement is ever established far from a well-stocked fishing lake or river, preferably underground. 
Indeed, the Gnomic skill with Rod and Line is almost legendary. The largest Gnomic community in the Empire, Glimdwaro, is to be found beneath the hill range known as the Mirror Moors, and numbers nearly a thousand in inhabitants. Like other Gnomic settlements, it is run along complex hierarchical lines, but since each member of the community has several different roles and a correspondingly different status according to which role they are filling, Gnomic society invariably strikes outsiders as an incomprehensible confusion. Even their cousins, the dwarfs, find it difficult to fathom the significance of the innumerable Gnomic customs and rules of etiquette. In each community, there is a clan overlord who acts as a sort of head of state. There is a religious leader who deals with matters spiritual, a craftsmaster who supervises mining and smithing activities, and a law master who guides the secrets of the clan's history, preserves its learnings, and ensures that ancient customs and rituals are observed with clockwork precision, a sort of metronome, oh god. Why? <laughs> Sorry, that just kind of threw me off. Some clans also have a spellmaster who passes on the gnomic skills in illusion weaving to those few gnomes deemed worthy of such an apprenticeship. Then of course the society's warriors are trained in the use of weapons and assigned to the gnome guard. Okay, so what we know here is a few different things. We know that they are, at this point when this was canon, uh, they are quite active with the Empire. Even if it's just a court jester type of thing, it's still very prestigious, especially having a place in the royal palace, essentially, right? You're there, you can be a sort of influence. We know that some sort of gnomic settlements do exist in the Mirror Moors, and yeah, that's actually fairly centralized within the Empire and that they are quite active. Early lore suggested that the gnomes were related some way to the dwarfs, this has changed a little bit later on, which we will discuss, and that they've also got access to some sort of magics, which I think is actually quite impressive, as they obviously have some sort of natural affinity to magic. So let's carry on as there's a few things to talk about. So we do have some details on the gnomic physique and character, let's read over that section. Gnomes in the Empire have often been described, though never to their faces, as small or petty dwarfs. Quite the insult, really. They are undoubtedly distant relatives. This is something, again, which is... Um, Old lore, right? Don't take this as gospel. Uh, sharing the same stocky build and long shaggy beards, but they're about 10 inches shorter on average. This is still the same though, and are noted for their large bulbous noses. Gnomes are both nimble and more dexterous than their larger cousins, and these facts, coupled with their well-known apathy for other races, has often led to them being labelled thieving stunties, but they also include some highly skilled illusionists among their number, for unlike the dwarfs, some of them have a great natural aptitude for this kind of magic. Gnomes are also excellent smiths and craftsmen, and are fascinated, not to say obsessed, by all things mechanical. They love gadgets of all kinds. Few gnomes actually live as part of human society, but they profit greatly from trade in gnomic artifacts. Most gnomes are great practical jokers, there's nothing they like better than a good laugh at someone else's expense, but woe betide the man or woman who dares to extract the Michael from a gnome, especially if he or she dares to make any derogatory comments about the gnome's lack of stature. Not for nothing do they have a reputation for being short-tempered and difficult to get on with being gregarious creatures who invariably make their homes in uh, communal burrows and caverns, it is unheard of for a gnome to spend any length of time in the wide open spaces that foster rangers. The rest is more related to just stuff in the game. We do know that they can be other things like say for example engineers, bodyguards, beggars, artisans, nobles, outlaws, just the general stuff that you can expect from, well, gnomes and just stuff that you can expect within the empire anyway. Early lore seems to put them very closely related to the dwarfs being distant cousins. What is actually very, very interesting is the fact that many of them can be engineers. We know engineering is quite popular within Warhammer. We see that a lot with the dwarfs. We see that a lot with the humans, the Skaven, and so on. I wonder what type of stuff the gnomic engineers will actually make, though. Now, the most notable thing that we do know of the gnomes at this point is the fact that they can be jesters. So let's read over the jester entry. Jesters have been employed by most noble families in the Empire, since time immemorial. In a political system where intrigue and double dealing is the quickest way to the top, the fool serves 
the dual function of relieving the pressures of command by presenting his slash her employer in a comic light and of being a trustworthy confidant. See, this is something I said earlier on. Someone without the political ambitions of their own. Very doubtful though, I could imagine that they'll still have some sort of political ambitions to further gnomic culture or just the better of their race, essentially. Anyways, let's carry on. With their pension for biting put-downs and off-the-cuff wit added to their complete disinterest in the politics of the Empire, gnomes are ideally suited to this role. It is true that they rarely remain in the job for long. So or later they will either get fed up of being isolated from their own kind or get carried away and have to be dismissed for insulting some visiting dignitary. I love that. That's something that I would kind of do if I was a jester. Anyways, nevertheless, these imperial nobles unable to find a gnomic jester have often been heard to bemoan the fact that they don't have a gnome to go to. Oh my god. Early Warhammer fantasy. Uh, cringe, but in a fun way, right? Yeah, I still imagine that they will have some sort of schemes. If they're working for a noble, it's probably to benefit the other gnomes, or at least that's the way I would do it if I was a gnome. We're not going to talk about religion just yet, as there's a lot more context in later lore, but what you will see is there's actually a decent amount of gnome uh, artwork. We also know that they're a neutral good race, uh, and they speak... Gasoly, which is a form of gnomic dialect of Kazalid. Not too sure if that still remains as a dialect of Kazalid, because at the end of the day, you know, um, they aren't really related anymore as far as we've seen. Or at least not too much lore actually points to that. But uh, yeah, they did have some miniatures back in the day too and rules for that. Keep in mind, obviously, a lot of races and factions were actually established in Warhammer Fantasy back in the day and just never really brought into more recent lore. Uh, this is something that we're going to be covering a lot more in this channel, but I thought it was actually kind of interesting because the lore itself isn't actually bad, it's just not really that fleshed out. I still like the idea of gnomes, I really do, but let's move on, right? Now, like I said, gnomes were pretty much just ignored for the rest of Warhammer Fantasy Battle and rest of Warhammer Fantasy in general. It wasn't until Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition which brought them back. We've got a little bit of an entry here. It goes into their history again, but it provides actually a lot more context. So let's start talking about this. Let's read over it, right? As far as most of the Empire is concerned, gnomes are a myth found only in overblown Bretonian romances or outdoor fenning dreadfuls where they frequently appear as magical tricksters. However, there is a truth behind the stories, for gnomes are not only real, but they live in the Empire. This is just bringing them back into canon properly. Gnomes, or Nomi as they call themselves in their native tongue of Gasali, have a handful of settlements within the Empire's borders, but do not mix with the broader human population to any significant degree. So uncommon are they, gnomes are often mistaken for over thin halflings by ill-educated folk. So. The language remains, but no mention of Kazalid, so it's very likely that uh, gnomes have been turned into their own separate race, possibly still originating from Albion, because it just kind of makes sense. And again, they are not related to halflings too. So let's continue. Short, wiry, with bulbous noses and large, rounded ears, gnomes have thick hair, dexterous fingers, and gruff voices that can be surprisingly deep for such uh, diminutive folk. They are a close-knit clannish people, putting family and personal loyalty ahead of most other concerns with stubborn tenacity that can surprise even the most intractable dwarf. Much as the legend suggests, gnomes are inherently magical and share a close relationship with Ulgu, the magical wind of shadows, illusions and deceit. Glimdwaro is the largest gnome settlement within the Empire, though rumours claim others lie beneath the Grey Mountains in Reichland, the Middle Mountains in Middenland, and the Kolsa Hills of Talabekland. Glimdwaro itself lies hidden below the Mirror Moors, to the south of Middenland, its burrows and halls cloaked by powerful illusions and vigilantly guarded by the Dwaro Guard, an elite unit of warrior wizards. Glimdwaro 
once boasted a bustling population of many thousands, but a century ago, the greenskin hordes of Grom the Paunch swept through the Mirror Moors and massacred almost all the gnomes hiding there. Today, Glimdwaro's crumbling chambers are largely empty, and only eight gnome clans survive, ruled by troubled Merowida Frain, the Ashen Queen. The leaders of the remaining clans openly hate each other, each blaming the others for the horrors Grom's greenskins unleashed. Okay, so this is actually really, really interesting. So we know now that a lot of the older lore still remains canon. The language, mostly where a large settlement is, and that's, you know, the magic affinity. What's very interesting here is that there's a lot more gnomes spread throughout the empire, but they're just very unheard of as they keep to themselves. And... Well, a lot of them died giving Grom the paunch. It's nice to see that being linked up with Grom too, because he did cause us a little bit of havoc. But yeah, I'm actually quite impressed. No mention of the ones near the World's Edge Mountains, but I guess they're more centralized than anything, and it makes sense for a lot of the gnomes, if any, to be very close to each other, as Midland, Reichland, and Talabekland are actually very, very close. We have the name of a character who clearly leads them, the Ashen Queen, obviously very linked up to the Lord of Shadows, but not too much there. Either way, I'm actually quite excited about this because we haven't really seen too much about gnomes in a long, long time. But Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay always does like a really cool thing about just going back into obscure lore. I absolutely love the writers for it because it's just kind of cool. I know it's not too exciting for a lot of people, but, you know, seeing old Warhammer brought into new Warhammer is always kind of nice. Now, what you would have noticed on the other page is opinions, and everything is just kind of standard. It's the opinions of gnomes towards other races. So, they don't really speak to the wood elves. Uh, on the dwarfs, they're like, you know, they exist in a sense. But, in the second page, there's a really interesting quote regarding the high elves. So let's read it. Year after 200 years, I'm still jumping mad at them elves. If it hadn't been for they idiots, we'd still be accepted across the empire. But no, it's their way or nothing. And sadly, that Emperor Magnus listened to those bloody elves about what magic is. So here we are, hiding away, jumping at shadows. It seems that they're not as widely accepted throughout the empire anymore. We saw that with the other information where they couldn't really travel too freely. But, yeah, I'm actually really, really interested as why this is the case, as even witch hunters kind of chase them. And it's probably because of some magic stuff that we'll talk about later, but on the human section, it does say that the witch hunters do chase them for whatever reason. Now, the reason why this strikes out to me so much is because it's during the time of Magnus, and it's potentially something that we could see explored in Warhammer the Old World, the return of Warhammer Fantasy Battle, which is going to be centered around the Great War Against Chaos, the time of Emperor Magnus. I am really, really interested about the gnomes right now, mostly because of that. This is literally the reason why I'm actually making this video. However, we might already know a reason why. You see, there's a small entry regarding gnome wizards, and it goes as follows. Gnomes can only learn the lore of shadows, dark magic, and chaos magic. Yeah, that's the big thing. Like wood elves, some gnome wizards study dark magic, which results in significant interest from witch hunters. However, they recognize its dangers and have outlawed necromancy and demonology. Using chaos magic of any kind is strictly forbidden, which makes me think that they might have used chaos magic in the past. Maybe this was a big reason as to why Emperor Magnus with the Council of the High Elves, as the High Elves were actually teaching the humans how to use magic, they were like, well, you know, you can't use this, this is going to bring in more trouble, and the gnomes obviously got outcasted because of it. I actually find it very, very interesting, as, well, yeah, you don't really hear too much of chaos magic being something that might have potentially been a part of society, especially with something that's kind of humanoid that isn't inherently chaos, you know? Uh, it's it's kind of confusing, especially since they can still use it, right? It says it there, they can only learn the Law of Shadows, Dark Magic, and Chaos Magic. Um, I understand the Dark Magic stuff because it kind of fits with the theme of being hidden away and so on, it's very similar to the Law of Shadows, 
but I really hope we do get some more context regarding gnome wizards. We also know that they're not completely outcasted in this entry. In the duchies bordering the Mirror Moors and nearby Midden Marshes, gnomes are relatively well known as they are often found abroad as entertainers, wandering peddlers or merchants. Peddlers themselves are like traders, essentially. Locally, they are known as Moorfolk, a secretive people with untrusting natures who fish the Midden Marshes. Rumours of Moorfolk practicing forbidden magics are common, which attracts witch hunters to the region in significant numbers, though few find anything more than open moors and dangerous local fauna, including river trolls, fen worms, which awesome, and bog octopuses. This is something that, um, some creatures that I kind of want to talk about in uh, future videos because they're actually kind of cool. Um, yeah, so we know that they're there and they do trade and stuff, but I guess they are very rare to go out. So when they go out, they'll trade, maybe not show up for a few years again. Either way, we know that they're fairly active even if it's just centralized to a specific area. We get a little bit more context in regards to gnome history. According to gnome myth, there were originally 444 great clans of gnomes. The gods created each clan for a specific purpose, which was secretly imparted to the great mother of each clan to pass on to her children. Today, few gnomes believe such fables, but priests and priestesses continue to repeat the old stories, warning the surviving clans that they should never forget their original purposes. In Glimdwaro, only eight clans remain, and most gnomes in Reichland hail from one of those eight. A gnome's clan name is inherited from the mother and never changes, even when a gnome marries. Many gnomes, secretive folk such as they are, prefer to keep their clan name secret, and instead offer an epithet as a surname. These names are often descriptive, self-mocking, and sometimes sardonic, uh, such as Mudfoot, Glitter Eye, Soul Heart, and Patchcloak. Okay, so they use fake surnames. Uh, what's pretty interesting here is a few things that we need to talk about. First up, loads and loads of clans. This actually could be true, considering that it was only about a hundred years ago when Grom the Paunch decided to destroy a lot of the Empire, and, well, just in general, a lot of things within his war. Um, so, maybe it's true? The fact is, it's kind of weird to lose that type of history and make it more as uh, religious tales more than anything else in just a hundred years or so. But, yeah, I mean, this is still pretty interesting. It could be possible, and there are loads of clans in different locations. I guess that could be respective of the other areas. Like, right now, I believe this book is mostly focusing around the Moorfolk, so there's others in Tyler Beckland which could have different type of folklore. Religion is actually very important to the gnomes, and they even have their own pantheon. Let's just read over the starter entry and get into the rest. Gnomes believe their gods created the gnome species in a time of great need, tasking each clan with a specific purpose. Even though most of these legendary tasks are lost to myth, gnomes typically have a very close relationship with their gods. Most pray before enacting any activities associated with one of their deities, and it is common for gnomes to make offerings to ensure not to fall into disfavor. In general, no god is placed above any other, although each clan usually favors one god over the others for traditional reasons. When abroad, gnomes have no desire to offend the other gods and often visit at local temples and shrines to make appropriate offerings. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Which they feel will make it more likely they will pass through foreign lands safely. Okay, fair. There's a different uh, alternative motive. But it's kind of interesting because they were created for a specific purpose. It could be that these gods are the old ones or linked to the old ones in some way, shape or form uh, as a lot of deities do kind of get linked up. They could be part of the Great Plan, we'll have to wait and see, as more context could possibly show up for the gnomes in the future. But now we know of three deities, we only originally knew of one, so it's kind of interesting because we've got a god of travel, trade and thievery, a god of shadows, revenge and magic, and a god of entertainment, spies and trickery. Before anything, let's talk about the gnomic priests. 
Gnomes dedicating themselves to the service of the gods and ensuring their chosen deity is appeased draw respect from other gnomes as they understand just how capricious and difficult the gods can be. Gnomes looking for spiritual guidance in matters directly related to one of the gods will often turn to a priest for advice. So a priesthood is quite important. This is kind of expected as, uh, I mean, it's Warhammer Fantasy. Religion does take a lot here. Like it's a very main thing when it comes to different cultures within Warhammer Fantasy. Anyways, let's talk about one of the gods. The first one is Evorn, that is the god of travel, trade, and thievery. She appears as a benign middle-aged gnome with a high stack of goods piled upon her back atop which is perched a magpie. Those who follow her ways wander the world, trading their goods for local produce while simultaneously stealing anything that uh, may be of use to gnome kind as a whole. I like that they're still little thieves, right? So, the scriptures are as follows. One coin in ten belongs to A1. So, I'm assuming that means that 10% uh, of your actual earnings has to go to the church. By theft or barter, make a profit every day. Okay, not bad. Never be caught in a lie. I guess it makes sense for the gnomes. Never stay in the same location for more than a month. Okay, pretty interesting. And finally, steal items of use to the gnomi and take them back to your clan. Okay, fairly interesting. I kind of like the idea of this, as it shows that they're still keeping the core law from many, many years ago. Anyways, let's move on to the second god, Mabin, which is the god of shadows, revenge, and magic. She has no permanent form and is usually depicted only as a grey cloak, silver blade, and pointed grey hat, which those sworn to her normally wear. She is known for her fanatical devotion to the gnome race and her complete lack of what most mortal folk would consider as morals. Great. Uh, worship of Mabin has increased considerably in Glimdwaro, as the devastation wrought upon the boroughs by, uh, there by Grom the Paunch a century ago. She is primarily a deity of Darrowgard. Okay, so again, pretty interesting, as she is becoming like a prime deity, I kind of like the idea, and her scriptures are as follows, which kind of bring in a little bit more context. Protect the known boroughs no matter the cost. Always take vengeance for wrongs done to you, your clan, or your boroughs. Never reveal the location of your home borough to outsiders. Practice with your sword for at least an hour a day, and if you seek to be unseen, do not be spotted. So far, she might actually be the most interesting of the gnome gods to me. The last is Ringo, and this was actually the first god ever introduced for the gnomes. We actually know a lot more about this god, but we're going to go into the very basics. Ringle is the god of entertainment, merriment, and trickery. He is generally portrayed as a impish, elderly jester wearing motley. However, for all his foolish appearance, Ringle is also the patron of spies, subterfuge, and detection. Known for slipping into and out of form, any danger in order to gather intelligence to protect his people with his scriptures being as follows. Do not deny any reasonable request to entertain others. Do not share any secrets outside your clan, cult, or cronies. Do not let a serious moment pass without a gag, a song, or a trick. A practical joke is the best revenge. Learn a useful secret every week. Pretty interesting, honestly. Um, I like these gods, I really do. I think the deities are actually pretty interesting as they do provide something... Very different. Like, yes, we do see these types of traits in other deities, but then again, a lot of them are going to be kind of samey, no matter the race. But I feel like these deities fit very, very well with what we know of the gnomes. Going back to all the lore, Ringle was actually the god of smiths and jesters for the gnomes, and he was like a principal deity. He was actually known as the chief deity. It's pretty interesting that they were considered neutral, even the god was considered neutral. He had uh, places of worship, the fact that there were temples in the boroughs, loads of different other types of scriptures. A lot of this has changed and it could really not be considered canon anymore. I like the idea that some stuff has changed, obviously, some stuff has stayed. But it's great to see that the general gist of the gnomes has stayed the same and it's a race that uh, maybe we could see potentially as a miniature, as a one-off or something for Warhammer of the Old World. Maybe some new lore for Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, as seeing the return of these races is always kind of fun. It's not something that has to be considered core, cool because let's be honest, uh, gnomes play a very insignificant part of Warhammer Fantasy history, but seeing the return of these 
brings me hope for the future, say, for example, for Centaurs, which were mentioned by uh, Games Workshop a long time ago, uh, when Old World was announced, or a little bit after. But yeah, I just wanted to talk about Gnomes today, because I'm really enjoying going back into all the lore and just discussing stuff, uh, their implications, and what it could be for the future. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think about the gnomes in the comments below. Let's start a bit of a discussion. Uh, I'm hoping to make these lore deep dives a bit more regular thing. You guys seem to enjoy it too, so I'm actually quite happy about that. It's not just because it's good for my channel, but I just like going into all the lore. It's nice to discuss. But yeah, I'll see you all again very, very soon, guys, and have a good day.